Birds. I have been um, I'm an attorney that's actually out of Marietta, and I've been practicing law for 19 years, but exclusively on surrogacy and donor situations for the past about seven. And uh, I think I get better every every occasion because I see more and more different set of circumstances that we adjust to. And I've gotten the 330 phone calls, babies are on the way, I've flown to the courthouse, gotten retroactive orders, and, and it usually always works. The good thing about the state of Georgia is that although we are a, a little bit arguably backwards um, in some areas, uh, we do not have any law on surrogacy, which I think is a good thing. And I uh, have battled against um, our legislature your body getting involved in things they don't know about, and I'll talk about that in just a little while. But as it stands now, we don't have any laws, and I think that's a good thing. But there are basically two legal phases of surrogacy, um, or only one when you're dealing with an egg donation, and that's the contractual. And there must be a contract in place between the intended parents and the surrogate, and she's married her husband setting forth all of the expectations, rights, obligations, understandings, uh, all kinds of issues that you can anticipate from compensation to insurance to bed rest to maternity clothes, all that kind of stuff we try and get down and I always urge uh, both parties to stick to the terms of the contract and don't go above and beyond a DBA. Once that's done, um, a legal attorney's opinion letter is uh, given to the fertility doctor and the procedures go from there. Now when I deal with agencies a lot of times that's taken place before I get in and I get involved in the second phase which is the pre-birth order or parentage phase and that's what brings uh, peace of mind to the intended parents for the most part because what um, let me, let me get a little bit on to the whole baby M and the scared thing. Everyone thinks about that first. Baby M was an anomaly. It was a traditional surrogacy. There was no psych psychological uh, review done. Uh, the attorney that handled that had like a trilogy of, 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 of bad cases that came uh, starting with that one. And so that was an anomaly. I don't have my statistics, but I do know that in surrogacy it is so successful, but that the chance of a fallout in the end is 0.01%. And of that, it's more times than not that it will be the intended parents that either are going through a divorce, and I had a horrible situation with that last year, or you know, one of them just says, not into this, not up for it. So it's rarely a situation where surrogate says, oh, this is a, you know, this is a keeper, because we screen that at the beginning. So uh, those kind of bad situations are definitely the exception. Um, and again, there has been no Georgia law statutorily put down and no reported cases of any contested problems. So that, that's a good thing for us. Uh, when we get a pre-birth order, I always ask people, once you get pregnant, let me know. And then we start collecting our information that we need for what's called a, well, the pre-birth order that we do in the form of what's called a petition for declaratory judgment. And that's a legal term that says we're going to declare in a judgment of the court who the parents are and who the parents aren't, the surrogate not. That we have to um, override the legal understanding in the state that if a woman is giving birth, it's her child, and if she's married, it's her husband's child. So we overcome that legal presumption by presenting verified pleadings, which means they're sworn pleadings from the intended parents and, and the surrogate saying that, uh, you know, this was done, this was our intention. I like to get a doctor's affidavit saying that on such date I retrieved eggs, I fertilized eggs, uh, we implanted eggs, and this pregnancy is a result of all that. And when I can get a doctor to do that, doctors do not um, weigh in on legal issues when they don't have to. But when I can get them to do that, and I've never had one tell me no, that gives a lot of credibility to the court system that everybody, you know, that, that there's been a legal genetic chain of custody established. So that's one thing I do. Also, I get the state of Georgia, who's, who's been very open-minded with me through uh, the Office of the Attorney General that represents the Office of Vital Records to make sure the birth certificate is going to issue the way it's supposed to, and we're going to get the birth mother surrogate, whether she's any kind of any kind of surrogacy, I'll touch on that in a minute, off. And so we, that, that gives uh, the party's peace of mind, it gives the hospital peace of mind. We have excellent hospitals here, especially in the Atlanta area. Northside Hospital is fabulous. 
uh, very familiar with all types of surrogacies and works very well. Gives them peace of mind too because they want to know whose baby it is, whose it isn't, who gets to hold, you know, take it, who makes the medical decisions, who gets banded, who's in the room, who do they bill for insurance. We always have the if surrogates insurance goes uh, prenatal, post birth pediatric coverage is under the intended parents. And so we make that and then that's what they want to know and then intended parents want to know we're going to get on that birth certificate, right? So I go to court with all this documentation and I like to do it at least a month if there's a singleton, two months if there's multiples because you never know when they may come. And even though I've been successful in getting retroactive when I need to be, I like it in place. And then when I get it done, I get certified copies of the order, I send it to all those parties, hospital, hospital council, attorney general, OBGYN, who typically fills out the, the birth certificate stuff, um, surrogate, put it with your stuff and take it with you everywhere you go, intended parents, so Ed and I keep a copy in case anybody loses it. Um, so everyone's got it and everyone's going to be on board by the time the baby or babies get here and have not had a problem with that being recognized at any of the hospitals and any of the births. So that, that is how it works out. A lot of times we're talking about egg donor. That's another documentation that I like to include in there saying that at the time of the egg donation, donor's donation, she relinquished all rights and obligations to this egg, any embryos as a result of it, and certainly any children. So that's another document. So by the time we go to court, our petition and response of pleadings, because the surrogate needs to be represented as well, is a full document. It's voluminous, but it's been successful all the time. Uh, it's also sealed. Anything involving the birth of the child, I like to have sealed so that it's not open to the public. So that's um, the way it goes here. Now that's when I have, again, as we talked about, there's really three kinds of surrogacies. A traditional surrogate that's been going on since Genesis, whether people with closed minds like to admit it or not. Yeah, and I ask them to please put away the you know, Bible or, or read it. One, because this has been a very effective <laughs> tool for you know, people having families. And the state of Georgia has recognized that as any other surrogacy, so that helps me out. Then when I, um, other than traditionals, I'd say I have about half and half with gestational and egg donor for whatever reason, whether it be a same sex or whether it be a cancer survivor or whatever, there are a lot of times you have egg donor in there and that's about 50-50 and I've been successful in all but two situations where the court refused to recognize the uh, a parent because there was no biological connection. I have learned that I avoid certain counties in the state of Georgia because this is Georgia and some are just not as open-minded or progressive thinking or understanding as others and I won't go there. And I can kind of alter my uh, the way I go about jurisdictionally to secure a proper jurisdiction based on either bringing in the um, Office of uh, Vital Records as a party or where the hospital is and, they, and everybody's on board with Can that. you elaborate on that a little bit more about how you decide where the jurisdiction is? Is it versus where the, the surrogate mother is or where the, where the intended parents are? You know, how well, does that... if both are in the, the state of Georgia, uh, I'd look at where they are. If it's in Fulton County, Cobb County, Gwinnett County, we're going. And I've done some down in, in South Georgia and everything. But I have found that certain counties, particularly Fulton, are more respect, receptive <coughs> to the whole idea and any alternative lifestyle things. The cab is apparently very open to it too. I just haven't had anybody there. So that's how I, I, I look to the residents of either party and I can make the respondent where you know it's going to be in their their county of residence, so I can play around with that either way it works. Laws decisions I'm aware of both come from Massachusetts, and in those two decisions, the Massachusetts court originally ruled that the law of the state where the surrogate resides is the governing law in a case. This isn't about county issues. This is about mm -hmm. state issues. Mm -hmm. um, and but in a second case in which a surrogate came from New York, where surrogacy is illegal, mm -hmm. the couple came from Connecticut, and the baby was born in Massachusetts. The court held that the principal contacts were in Massachusetts where the baby was born right. and therefore governed. So we generally say to people where the child is delivered right. is the state that governs first and where she lives is the state that governs second. But in my many years of experience there have been surrogates 
who have fainted at work and been taken to a local area hospital, mm -hmm. who have delivered in 20 minutes on their toilet. Um, and I, therefore, will not allow a surrogate to deliver in another state unless both the state she lives in and the state she's going to are legal, because I do not want to run into any problems. And especially when working with a gay couple, my biggest concern is either a pre-birth order or a second parent option. I also have to make sure that both those states will grant that to them in the end, because ultimately the court is going to say, not from a county by county perspective, right. but a state by state perspective, where did she deliver? Mm -hmm. um, and in case last minute she doesn't deliver there, right. where did she live? I put my contracts during the last month of pregnancy, she not travel anywhere. Sometimes you can't help it. One of my very we first ones, well, she she was in North Georgia line instead of coming south, she went north and delivered in Tennessee. So I just basically had to beg their Office of Vital Records to give full faith and credit to my uh, to my court order, which uh, they did. So it wasn't a problem, but it could be a problem. So that's basically um, how how I deal with it in dealing with hospital counsel, hospital OBGYN, the state of Georgia, and, and really have had no, no problems with any of that. Uh, and like I said, all of them are, are all, all types of surrogacies are uh, treated alike. So at, at, the, at, at the current stage where we are, the only law in place um, is a law, pre well, okay, two now. But the first one was a law preventing home inseminations. And if I get, could get even a dime for every time I've gotten contacted on my website as far as we want to save some money and do an artificial insemination at, at home, it's a felony in the state of Georgia. And that can't be done. I don't, I don't know whether it's actually a health concern or a lobbyist thing on the, the medical community, but it, even a nurse can't do it. So that's really the only law that we had. Uh, they've dabbled the past two years, and they don't even touch on surrogacy because they, they readily admit they don't understand it, but they've tried to limit egg donors as, and not sperm donors, which nothing causes me more angst than that. Yeah, I'm going to talk equal protection. But at any rate, um, but they found out, particularly last year, that, that it's typically the um, far right that likes to contest anything. It's a personhood thing. That, that's going on all over the nation. But we, um, they found out in a big way that the fertility world is as outspoken now as the right to lifers are. And they said, ooh, maybe we shouldn't have gone there. And the only thing that they came up with last year was what we call an Option for Adoption of Embryo mm -hmm. Act, which means if someone's trying to adopt an embryo, they have the right to go to court and have it made a court order, but it's not mandatory. So basically, even though the right to life is you know, claiming victory, it really does nothing. But that makes them happy then we're fine but otherwise there are no laws in the state of Georgia except one thing that I run into and I don't do a lot of second I don't do any second parent adoptions because I do more of the surrogacy work but there I, I it can be done a couple of my colleagues get it done I don't I have not been asked to do it you guys have never asked me and really nobody else has because I what I what I do do is get a you know, we just travel under a single father. Whoever the biological father is is who the biological father is. Like we said, go home to the home state and uh, get a second parent adoption done there. So that's usually what I do, and I've been asked to do some things that I just simply say I can't do when they want to mix, mix sperm or not know who the real dad is and all that. I, you know, there's limitations on what I can do. But there's been more and more of uh, variations of family building coming along and I'm going to have the opportunity to represent a surrogate in one of those situations so I'm going to learn something else for my next one but that's typically what we do now is I get uh, when I have out-of-state single fathers I call them because that's Georgia just doesn't recognize that kind of a marriage so uh, I just get it under the biological and then I get the birth mom off and then there's only one parent listed and they can go home and rent their and do that or if I truly have someone that's not, and my, one of my very favorite clients, and I was telling John, I just adored him, was a single, he was the single man from Australia, and we just had the best relationship, we still keep in touch. Um, and I just adore seeing pictures of him, and he flew over here, and I helped him get his expedited passport, and you know, we He's met him. Yeah, yeah, I, I love it. Love it. He'll be back. Yeah, he'll be back. I, yeah, I just adored him and just the di the different lifestyles from him being over there and everything. We just had a great time. But we got it. You know, he and his baby flew out on that 24-hour flight out of here, and it was great. But that's how I usually handle it when I have same-sex out of state. I just have to travel under the single dad.
Now, if it's same-sex um, female partners, well, I don't know, you know, the options are, I've done contracts that are more like egg donation contracts. If one gives to the other, you know, one's going to be the egg donor and the other's going to be the one who gives birth and that's how they raise their family. We don't have to go to court on something like that. You just have an egg donor contract in place and no court order is involved. Um, how can I answer any questions? That's basically what, what we do. The two legal phases, uh, the con contractual part, and then the pre-birth parentage, which gets very, very much involved, but I've never had any problems getting it done or recognized or any fallouts from it.